Welcome to what I hope will be a useful bit of video to help you be a bit more confident about recognising and naming most of our common grasses. I recently took a class in the wild, well, Evington Park, hardly wild, but in the, in the open air about recognising grasses. And uh, Nature Spot suggested that it would be useful to have this class as a video. Uh, when I thought about doing it as a video, I realised not having the actual specimens and not knowing where you lived and what grows around you, uh, it might have to be adapted. So what I've done is listed the most useful features of grass for identification and then illustrated them with common grasses so that you can see uh, how they can be useful to name, name them. I'll start with uh, some general stuff and I'll show you some of the features um, and uh, examples of the features, uh, photographs mostly courtesy of Nature Spot. Um, and then, uh, well, we'll see how it goes. Here we go. I've uh, talked about Leicestershire, but I think that most of the grasses that I'm talking about today are pretty common nationwide. And getting your eye in is something that, as you probably know already, is really useful. You work quite hard to start with looking at a species and then suddenly something clicks and you can recognize it, just like a, a human face. Suddenly something clicks and you can name it straight away. However, there's a tiny caveat and that is um, these are the mostly the most common grasses. Uh, the features that I'm showing often apply to much rarer species. So when you're looking at a grass, make sure that you're seeing the features that I've talked about. Uh, if there's any doubt, then you never know, you might have something a bit rarer. Right, grasses are flowering plants but they are wind pollinated. Lovely picture here of meadow foxtail uh, blowing in the wind. Uh, you can see anthers and stigmas uh, out there exposed to the wind so that they're pollinating. They don't need showy flowers to attract insects. So the flowers are mostly small, green and often there are many of them packed tightly together. Uh, each fertile female flower contains just one ovule. Oh, this photograph, uh, I'll be doing this throughout the presentation, was taken on the 11th of May. Um, this particular grass, one of the helpful things for identification is how early it flowers. Um, and uh, that's a useful clue when you're coming to uh, identify species sometimes. Okay, just to distinguish from some of the grass lookalikes, little poem, sedges have edges, rushes are round, grasses need hollow right down to the ground. Here's a knee on a grass. Now the other species, the other genera here, don't have knees generally along their flowering stems, but the edges of the flowering stem or culm in sedge is, is a good way that the triangular cross section is very helpful to distinguish those from grasses. Uh, also, they have a, a, w, a W cross section to the leaf quite often, and that's useful for distinguishing them. Uh, Rushes tend to be round, although they can be oval in cross-section. 
And uh, one of the nice things about rushes that helps to distinguish them is that very often the flowers don't seem not to be at the tip of the stem, but to be on one side of the stem or in the axles. So um, a few things that will help you to be sure you've got a grass. Now, the flowering, the uh, names of parts, uh, they're, they're so useful, really. I'm sorry to have to use these technical terms, but they are useful because they easily, quickly help you to describe the bit you're after. So here's one of the very nice drawings supplied by Lindsay Ann Heald, drawn by Lindsay Ann Heald. Thank you very much, Lindsay Ann. This shows the vegetative parts, the main important ones. Uh, first of all, we have the flowering stem, which we call the culm. Uh, in this case, if the plant is relatively robust and its culm is flattened near the base and the, the plant, the whole plant has a bluish glaucous tinge, it is a good indication, here's the flattened culm, even with a slight hint of a wing on it, is a good indication that you have coxfoot, a grass that I'm sure you're familiar with. This one taken on the 31st of May. Now, as opposed to the culm, there's the tiller. I and mean, we use that term for a, a shoot which is not yet got to flowering stage. And uh, this can be useful too, uh, and it's useful to dis distinguish it from the culm. Um, when you're looking at rye grasses, if the topmost youngest leaf here is flattened like that, I hope you can see that. There's a pretty poor photo, but you can just about see the flattened leaf inside its sheath just there. Then you can distinguish perennial ryegrass from perennial ryegrass from its rather look-alike species, which has a rolled leaf, and that's Italian ryegrass. All right, it has usually has awns as well, these little spikes as well. But this is a good way of distinguishing between the two, the flattened for perennial ryegrass, the rolled for Italian ryegrass. Dates. And there we are. Okay, the node is the other important vegetative, another important vegetative uh, feature. And if it's conspicuously hairy, uh, much more hairy than the sheath or the, um, the upper uh, stem, then you've got creeping soft grass. Quite a late flowering species. Now, moving on to the leaf itself, um, we've got the leaf blade, which as it joins the leaf sheath may have these extrusions, these oracles. And quite often at the top of the sheath, there is a, a flap of a membrane called the ligule. Now, if the blades of the grass are rolled and bristle-like, this is typical of the smaller fescues. I hope you can see from this photograph they're not flattened blades, as in the drawing, but they're rolled around, so they stay tightly rolled. Possibly a means of conserving moisture. And there you have a uh, red fescue. Our commonest. However, if the blade is softly downy, this is quite a close-up photograph, but you can see it even without a lens and you can feel it with your fingers, um, you've got Yorkshire fog, or you may have Yorkshire fog, 
I mean, always other species, but this is the commonest. Okay, if the leaf blade is harshly rough, especially if you grip it between your two fingers, like that, and, and like that, and try to pull your fingers up the leaf like that, uh, and can't because it's so rough, then you've got tufted, or may well have tufted hair grass. Slightly later flowering grass, and that one's just coming into flower. Um, at the top of the sheath and at the base of the leaf, we've got some outgrowths which you may see on some grasses. Uh, some of them they overlap, some of them they don't overlap, some of the grasses don't have them at all. Uh, little ear-like flaps called oracles. And we can use those to help us with ID too, because if they are ciliate, that is to say they have little hairs growing along their edges like that, then you have a way of distinguishing tall glow, tall fescue, incidentally, um, but I'm sorry to mention these things, but this, well, I was lucky to find this so late in the season. This is a feature which best shows early in the season, tall fescue, as against meadow fescue, which has much rarer grass, which has uh, no cilia on the oracles. And just because this is such a super photo, I've included this. This is um, giant fescue. And he here you can see that the oracles really do overlap. And look at that wonderful purplish color, which is a feature of that species. Yes, uh, lucky to find that on the 25th of July. Occasionally, the ligule can be just a fringe of hairs. No, no membranous flap, but just a fringe of hairs. And that's a good feature for common reed, but you probably don't need it for common reed <laughs> because it's such a distinctive grass. Uh, and even look in the 4th of October, in, right through the winter, you'll recognize that one. Okay, now the ligule, itself is quite a useful item. And if it's longer than wide, and I think you can just about make that out on this photograph, longer than the, the wraparound width, it helps to distinguish creeping bent from its very close relative common bent. Uh, a bit, bit, bit difficult to see with this one, uh, but you can see perhaps that the ligule is not pointed, like that one, and shorter. Um, and another little feature of these two bents, which are both very common grasses, is that this one has uh, quite densely clothed branches, whereas this one, the branches are much, the whole inflorescence is much more open uh, and the Spikelets tend to be at the tips. More of that anon. Okay, this is a, a later flowering uh, genus. And here is an example where a long ligule, the long ligule of rough meadow grass, can help you distinguish it from smooth meadow grass, which has a much shorter ligule. If the leaf sheath, this bit is long hairy, you may well have false brome. Fairly common here. Uh, and there's a little trick that I'd like to show you for uh, helping you distinguish smooth meadow grass from rough meadow grass. Uh, and it's, uh, it's this little trick 
where you very gently try and move the culm at the base, the base of the culm, the sheath at the base of the culm, along your lips, a very sensitive part, the lips, and they can feel if it's rough or smooth. If it feels smooth, then you have um. Oh dear, what's happened? Oh. Oh, I don't know what's happened. Sorry. Keep going. Oh goodness, what happened there? Oh. Getting there. Sorry, so sorry. Crikey. There. I have no idea what I did. So if the the low sheath of comb feels smooth, you may well have smooth meadow grass, hence its name, as against rough meadow grass. As you can see, the inflorescence is hmm, fairly look alike, but that plus the ligule feature that I showed just now will help you distinguish those two species. Okay, finally, I think about the leaf sheath. Um, if the blade is rolled and bristle like, as I showed earlier, and the sheath is like this one, which comes together and is fused so that it's a continuous tube around the tiller, then you may have red fescue. Whereas with this one, oh, which has the wraparound unfused sheath, you could have sheep's fescue. Much rarer, smaller grass, but another useful little thing to help you distinguish between the two. Okay, so enough about the vegetative plants for the moment. Now we're going to move on to the inflorescence, the flowering section of the plant. And once again, it's terms first to get used to. First of all, this central stem that goes up the middle of the flowering section of the grass, we call that the rachis. And then the actual flowers, they often are clustered together in what we call a spikelet. In this uh, case, the spikelet has one, two, three, four, five, at least six florets. Uh, this is also a spikelet, but in this case, we only have one, actually one fertile one and, and one not quite fertile, fully fertile. We only have two florets. Each floret uh, is an individual flower with uh, a stigma and stamens that develop. You may not have both, in fact, may have neither. Okay, then at the base of the spikelet, the first thing up the stem is a thing, a scale called the gloom. Uh, and here's two glooms at the base of the spikelet, but I think perhaps because this one is hard against the, the rachis, this species only has one noticeable gloom on one side. Uh, and then this organ, the outer of these two, this one here, that's called the lemma. That helps to protect the actual um, sexual parts of the grass. Finally, um, there's this bristle-like protrusion, uh, which in this case is growing from the back of the lemma, but on some grasses, it can be an extension of a gloom, uh, and we call that the orm. Right, now uh, I'm gonna move on to categorizing, describing grasses by the category of inflorescence, the type of inflorescence that they have. I'm going to start with an inflorescence which is a simple, sim, simple spike. 
um, so that the spikelets themselves, you can't see the stalks, they might not even have stalks, um, they're so short. So they're, the spikelets are clustered around the rachis. This is Timothy. And another type of simple spike uh, is where you see the spikelets alternating up the rachis. Um, and this, as you probably know, is perennial ryegrass. So we go to the pointing finger type first. And once again, we have um, an annual uh, meadow foxtail. Sorry, meadow foxtail. And one of the useful features for this, apart from the fact of, as I've mentioned, it's an early flowering uh, species, is that the glooms, the, the spikelets, each one of these little structures is a spikelet. They have one awn projecting beyond them. I know that in this picture there are lots of awns, but then if you think about it, there are lots of spikelets. So one awn projecting from the centre is the spikelet, meadow foxtail. Here's some more Timothy, another pointing finger type, and a close-up of this uh, spike reveals that uh, there are two glooms and each of them narrows at its apex to an almost an awn, certainly a, a point. And so very different look uh, from of the spikelet. Of, of, of the spike and the spikelet. And look at the dates as well here, early flowering grass, later flowering. Okay, uh, similarly pointing finger, but now one-sided, all the spikelets are uh, avoiding one side of the spike. And this is crested dog's tail. Uh, and with this uh, pointing finger type, uh, I hope that you can see that it isn't really parallel sided at any point. It, it, it's a, more like an oval. Each one of these spikes is more like an oval. And this is sweet vernal grass, which does have, when it's fresh, another lovely little feature which helps, and that is the base of the leaf blade is ciliate and that helps you as well. Also if you've got a good sense of smell it's said to smell like new mown hay and even taste like it. Uh, early dates for this one, slightly later dates for this one. Okay, and the last pointing finger type inflorescence, you recognize that, that's a barley. Uh, very long horns on this. And this one, both pictures, uh, wall barley, an annual species which grows in pavements and rough cracks around towns and so on as, as well, but particularly there. There are other barleys, but I'm not going into that today fairly late flowering. And still with this uh, single spike that's at the tip of the culm, we've got the alternating spikelets type. And uh, you know this one already, we've seen it several times, perennial ryegrass. Uh, in this species, the spikelets are end on, if this is the, the rachis, the spikelet is sideways on to the rachis. I think you can see that. Remember, it, it's lost a gloom because of that. Uh, whereas with this species, the um, 
spy clip is a flattened spy clip with one of the flattened faces against the rachis. And that's common cooch. There is another one with alternating spikelets up the stem, which is fairly common, but these spikelets aren't flattened. These are more like sausages, and they're also uh, quite awned, and that's false brown. False brown is a pretty late flowering species, so is common cooch. Perennial ryegrass, hmm, seems to flower whenever. Okay, so that's the uh, part about the inflorescences, which are simple spike. Now we're going to look at the inflorescences, which have visible branches. And I'm dividing those into two to help uh, memorize them, recognize them. However, I've got to say that this is the least satisfactory field uh, field observation character of the whole presentation. So I'm sorry about that, but please bear with it. All the, all the fancy uh, ID books do use this feature. So we've got a spike clip with two or more florets to start with, with the lemmas visible beyond the gloom tips. Here's a good example. Uh, here are the glooms. And here are the lemmas of the individual florets in this speech in this uh, picture one two three four five six seven at least uh, florets per spikelet horns as well quite rounded and this is common soft brome um, some species have only one or two fertile florets in the spike clip and often in this case the lemmas are concealed by the glooms however when in full flower you still uh, can see all the bits and uh, let's see if we can find a good example here uh, anyway there there's the glooms open and you can see the lemons with the orms and this is false oak grass. Uh, it has only one really fully fertile floret per spikelet. Um, oh yes, and please note that as, as you can see here, when an inflorescence with branches is closed up, closed up, the uh, branches are not always immediately obvious. You can see them with the naked eye, but you don't, when you first see it, you might just think it's one of those simple spikes. Okay, and this just to try and help about this um, spikelets with just one or two florets, you can see one long gloom here, one shorter gloom there, the uh, lemma with the long horn. Uh, and when it's open, you can see that, well, you can just make out one proper flower. There, there are actually two, but one is not fully fertile. That remember, that's st still your false oat grass. Okay, so I'm going to use this little chart now. So we're going to, first of all, we're going to look at species with clearly visible branches that have two or more florets per spikelet. And with that set, we've got the ones without horns to start with. And they're the meadow grasses. That's a, so here we go, branch inflorescence, spikelets of two or more florets, lemmas visible beyond the gloom tips. And this is species without horns. And these are the meadow grasses. Here's our first, um, possibly the most common plant in the world. First meadow grass, this is annual meadow grass. Uh, you can just about see that there are more than two florets per spike clip. 
um, a special little feature for an annual meadow grass uh, to help you pick it out from the other meadow grasses is that it only has one or two branches at its lowest whirl, where the culm starts to branch into flower. Just one or two branches at the lowest whirl. There's smooth meadow grass with its short ligule and its smooth um, sheath and the much longer ligule of rough meadow grass. And these two species note at their lowest whirl, one, two, three, four branches. In this case, certainly more than two and can be more than four as well. Oh, and the date for annual meadow grass shows just why it's so successful. This species can get from germination to seed production in six weeks in the summer, uh, why it's so widespread and so successful. Okay, so still with branched uh, inflorescence, two or more florets per spikelet, but now species with awns. Okay, and this is, I'm going to divide this further. There's only one or two spikelets per branch. And in this case, we're back to common soft brome, and you can see that the spikelet is longer than its branch in most cases, and that there are only one or two spikelets for each branch. And in this species, the spikelets are usually shorter than these huge long branches. Um, this is barren brome. Uh, the spikelets are actually slightly flattened as well, whereas these are quite sausage-like. Both species with long horns. And if they've got three or more spikelets per branch, and the spikelets are long, narrow, and easily separated, you could have one of the larger fescues, for instance, the tall fescue. If the spikelets are shorter and clustered together, not so easy to eat, separate, then you could well have coxfoot. Uh, and the big thing about this species, of course, is although the awns are not obvious, they're there, but they're not obvious. What is obvious is that it, its lowest whirl, <laughs> if I can call it that, is only one branch. <laughs> I've been looking at quite a few for this uh, um, presentation, and I've found it very difficult to find any with two. I did find one, but... That's a really nice feature. Barren brome is quite a late flowering species. Okay, so moving on to the branched inflorescence, but these uh, species I'm now going to show you, they only have one or two florets per spikelet. And we'll start with the ones that don't have awns. And this is a fairly straightforward one to start with because the blades are very wide, more than a centimetre wide. Although it's not, this particular photo is not grown by water, that's not typical, it usually grows by water. And it's reed canary grass. Um, and a little caveat again here uh, the inflorescence can look almost like a simple spike uh, when it's closed up. However, those broad leaves and the fact that it's usually by water is pretty helpful with that one. And if the blades are much less than a centimetre wide, we are coming back to our common bent. 
and our creeping bent. And these, uh, these spikelets only have one floret within, just one floret. Uh, so they're very small and with common bent, there is a, an open feel to the inflorescence. Uh, the spikelets are widely spread and uh, often near the tips of the branches. Uh, this is more branched and uh, much more thickly clothed in spikelets, creeping bent. Fairly late flowering for reed canary grass and fairly late flowering for the bents. Okay, so moving on to these one to two florets only per spikelet, but with awns. And if you've got a long awn projecting far beyond the spikelet, and I hope you can see it here, I think you can, look, you can see these here and here, then, uh, and you can see the uh, glue wrapping around a great part of the floret, you've got false oak grass. But if the awns are much shorter than the spikelets and the plant is downy, you have the short awns, the spikelet, so you can see that they're small and the glooms are wrapping around the spikelet. You have Yorkshire fog, and I think in that photo you can just about really feel the very downy nature of the whole plant. Fairly late flowering for false oak grass and for Yorkshire fog. Okay, and if in, still in that category, branch spikelets, one or two fertile florets only in each spikelet and awns, if the leaves are harshly rough and the plant is truly tussock forming, then you've got tufted hair grass. Uh, and actually the awns aren't that easy to see, but the tufts and the roughness of the leaves are what help you to distinguish that one. Okay, a fair, again, a fairly late flowering grass. So that's uh, the end of the presentation. I hope you find it useful. Um, I haven't mentioned, I think I've forgotten to mention, that a lens, a 10 times lens, is really useful um, for this especially when you're looking at a spikelet and you the method of doing that is to hold the lens right to your eye and then bring the spikelet up to the lens until you can see it clearly in focus. So keep up the practice and if you do that you'll soon uh, find that you're naming these uh, things with much more ease and confidence. Good luck. I'd like to thank um, Nature Spot for encouraging me to have a go at this. Um, the photos on their websites are a really useful resource when you're trying to identify uh, grasses and some of the words, which I'm hoping we might even upgrade so that they match this presentation a little more. Uh, but there's photos, really good photos by Melinda Bell, Graham Kahlo, Dave Nichols, Craig Mabbott, H.A. Peacock and Barbara Cooper on their website. So thank you to them. Also, John Tinning. Thank you, John, for taking one or two. I think it was the creeping bent that was really useful. And a special thanks to Lindsay Ann Heald for her excellent diagrams. And Alan, thank you very much for helping with the making of this recording. Good luck.